Hello, world. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. Now, let me say it one more time. I might never get this opportunity again. Hello, world. <laughs> what a great opportunity to uh, speak to every continent. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we will get to that at the end. Some people use the text as a point of departure. I will use it as a point of arrival. So we will get that in just a moment. I was born and raised in India, and I heard about uh, a Bible college in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1971. I uh, wrote them a letter. I said, my name is Sam. Will you please uh, send me some information about yourself? And they did. They sent me a catalog and, and an application form. I filled out the application, put the money in it, and sent it back to Atlanta, Georgia. They, they said, we have accepted you as a student, but for you to come here as an international student, we need somebody to make a deposit of $1,000, of and we also need a letter from somebody saying that we will support you as a sponsor for the four years that you are going to be our student. Well, I did not know anybody in America. I had no nieces, nephews, uncles, cousins. Here, you all wouldn't return, return my phone calls. And so, uh, uh, but in those days, I used to play the accordion. Uh, and uh, I, I was just a kid, about 19 years of age, and there was this, uh, this couple from Pasadena, California, by the name of Bob and Vivian Steinbaugh. They came through a church for a Sunday night service, uh, and they sang and preached. I played the accordion for them, and that is all. I had their address, though, in Pasadena, California. So I wrote them a letter. I said, Dear Bob and Vivian, I don't know if you remember me or not, but I'm the kid in India that uh, I played the accordion for you on a Sunday night. Uh, I have applied to uh, this Bible college in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, they have accepted me, but they're looking for somebody to send them $1,000 and underwrite me for four years. Will you prayerfully consider that? Well, I did not know if they were going to reply to me, and what's the worst answer I could have got? No, but there's life after no. And, and, and so uh, three weeks later, I got a letter back from them. In fact, I still got that letter. The letter came back to me saying, Dear Sam, we have prayed about it. We remember you very well, and we would love to invest in your life. In fact, we've already sent $1,000 to the Bible college, and we will underwrite you. How amazing is that? Somebody believed in me. I'm standing talking to the world today because somebody invested $1,000 in my life, Bob and Vivian Steinbau. Somebody believed in me. Well, with that, I got my visa. I came on over to the United States of America, and uh, uh, life was good for me. Other students had to work. I was getting my bills paid because Bob and Vivian were writing my checks. But then 1974 happened. I came as a student in 1973. 1974 happened. We had a bad, bad, bad recessionary time in the United States of America. People were out of jobs. Things were not good. Bob lost his job in Pasadena, California. So he wrote a letter to the college saying, uh, I have lost my job. I cannot support Sam anymore. That's not good, in case you're wondering. That's bad news. Because I'm used to eating regularly by now, and uh, I've heard rumors that if you don't eat regularly, your body goes one place and your spirit goes somewhere else. And I'm committed to keeping my body and spirit in close communion as long as possible. <laughs> and so I went to immigration service, applied for a work permit. That's how international students work in the United States of America. And they turned me down because Americans were out of a job. They weren't going to give an, an Indian or uh, a foreigner a job that belonged to an American. But I needed to live. So I'd go up and down uh, the street that I, uh, the college was on. And I'd knock on people's doors and say, can I mow your lawn? Can I rake your yard? Can I clean your windows? Can I clean your gutters? Can I wash your car? And they'd all say, go away. And I said to them, I'll do it for you free. They said, what do you want? I said, well, if you can just Fix me a peanut butter jelly sandwich. That's what I need. And that's how life was for me in 1973, 1974. I, 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 remember, I remember about a half a mile away, uh, there was this uh, grocery store. Uh, and a mom and pop kind of a store, uh, large enough, but not large enough to be a superstore. And I went in there and talked to the manager. And I said to the manager, I said, uh, do you ever throw food away? And he said, uh, yeah, we have to. We... we, we uh, uh, have laws in the United States. There's an expiration date on it. I said, haven't you heard about the hungry children in India? The Indian is here. 
<laughs> and so, uh, how, many, how many of you remember uh, tombstone pizzas? Uh, yeah, those fro frozen, and I was walking past those, uh, the counters, I said, do you ever throw those away? He said, yeah, we have to. And so I walked out to deal with him, and every so often, well, I would go and help him pack the food he's going to throw away. But he couldn't give it to me for legal reasons. And I'd walk out there of the store into the back of the parking lot of a six-foot dumpster. And I'd say to him, throw it in real carefully. <laughs> he would throw it in. I couldn't go get into it till he got back inside the door. Once he got inside the door, I would jump into the dumpster and get my lunch. I've been dumpster diving before it was fashionable. But that store manager believed in me. Uh, I, I, had never, I had never done laundry in my life before till I went to college, and I did not know you had to separate the colored clothes from the white clothes and stuff like that. So I put them all in the, in, in, in the, in the laundromat and uh, put my quarter in there with the, with the soap in it, and uh, they all tumbled around, and I, I took them uh, into, the, into the, put them in the dryer, it was a big old commercial dryer, vertical dryer, uh, for a uh, dime in those days that had a lever saying hot, cold, I said, cold is good, hot is good, hot sounds better, so I put it on hot and left from there. When I, when I pulled out my clothes, I couldn't recognize any of them. <laughs> they, they had all changed shapes and colors. But since I didn't have any clothes to wear, the next day I went to class, uh, you know, uh, like Joseph's coat of many colors, uh, you know, and my shorts were shrunk like this, and my pants were like that. And, and, and there was a young man in, the, in my class, by Larry King. Larry King looked at me with great discernment. He said, Sam, you need new clothes. I still remember Larry King put me in his car after the, after the classes were over and took me to Goodwill, gave me 10 bucks. 1974, 10 bucks, Goodwill store, mm, I filled up a whole buggy. I'm here because of Larry King. I still remember my first new clothes uh, I bought in the United States of America. Well, somebody bought them for me, Paulette and Dwayne Thomas. After a Sunday morning service, they took me in their car to uh, say, we're going to buy you some clothes, we'll take you out for lunch. They took me to a cafeteria where all kinds of food was. I had never seen so much food in my life. And so, you know, you, you, you're supposed to get just one plate, but when you are eating now for then... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you get all you can. So I remember eating my best and the biggest meal and walking down the hallway into J.C. Penney. I still remember what I, for my first set of new clothes in the United States. I got uh, a beige silk turtleneck shirt, <laughs> black polyester pants with ruffles. <laughs> oh, those could, I mean, those were fancy. And, and, and uh, but they didn't have my shoes, so we crossed over to Kmart. I still remember the shoes I bought. The soles were like this, the heels were like this. <laughs> Five colors, brown, black, red, green, and purple. Those shoes could walk all by themselves. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I mean, they matched everything I had in my wardrobe. I'm here because of Paulette and Dwayne Thomas. Uh, the, the university gave me uh, a job. They, they asked me to be their janitor, breakfast cook, and dishwasher. Uh, and so uh, I had never cooked breakfast in my life. Uh, and in, in Atlanta, Georgia, they like to eat grits. And, and I had never cooked. And so uh, I had this, uh, this uh, supervisor from Rockingham, North Carolina. Her name was Annie Mae Sproles. And she taught me how to cook grits the old-fashioned way, real nice and slow over a slow flame. So, so uh, part of my job was to be the janitor. And there was a church on campus. And uh, my job was to go in there, clean it up, open it up, turn on the air, heat, whatever it might be. And... You know, you know, every church, every church has got somebody, uh, the lights are on, but nobody's home. Uh, you know, uh, just the elevator does not, does not go all the way to the top, uh, top floor. Uh, and, and we had one, her name was Ruth Weeks. Ruth Weeks wore, wore miscoordinated dresses and funny hats, and she was always muttering to herself, talking to herself under her breath. And so uh, it was uh, a midweek service, it was a Thursday night service, and uh, everybody had left. I had left too. I just came back to close the church down, to turn off the lights and the air and stuff like that. And I was going inside the church, and Ruth Weeks was coming out. And as Ruth Weeks was coming out, I had nowhere to go, so we were on collision course. So I shook her hand, and I said, how are you doing, Sister Weeks? She said, something, something. I don't know what she said. She muttered something in her breath, but left a piece of paper in my hand. 
I looked at it later on, and it was a dollar bill. In those days, you could go to McDonald's, get a Big Mac, order fries, couldn't supersize it, but order fries, and a drink, and have change left over from a dollar. After that, if nobody shook her hand, I shook her hand. <laughs> For three years, Ruth Weeks, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Thursday night, Ruth Weeks gave me a buck. No, no, you won't see Ruth Weeks in any marquee. Her name is not mentioned in any book. You Google her, you won't find her. But I'm here because of Ruth Weeks. In some way, in her own way, Ruth Weeks believed in me. The question is, who are you believing in? Because you see, none of us have come here. We've all been brought here. You didn't come here on your own. None of us in this room and everybody who's watching me worldwide have to realize that whenever somebody says, well, I, you know, I made a, you know, I'm a self-made man, I just won't look at you and say, didn't make much of yourself, did you? <laughs> because if you're going to be who God intends for you to be, it'll take an army of people who believe in you and to bring you to where we are. And so let me close the story. Remember I told you I was a janitor, breakfast cook, and dishwasher at this college? Twelve years later, I graduated in 1977, in 1989, twelve years later, that same college invited me to come back and be their president. Now, that is a leap of believing. Because people who are my bosses, and I'm their boss now. People who used to give me orders now work for me. The board of trustees is the same board of trustees that inviting this former janitor who cleaned toilets and swept floors, and painted walls, and picked up trash, who cooked breakfast for them and washed their dishes for them for three and a half years. And I look back on that, it was not that I was all that, it was not that I had proven myself, but they had the ability to believe in me. You, you see, see, that's the difference between people leaving an inheritance and people leaving a legacy. Inheritance is stuff. Inheritance is, is uh, stocks, bonds, cash, cars, houses, land. That anybody, anybody can buy that and leave inheritance for you. But legacy is totally different. Legacy is never a thing. Legacy is always a person. You never leave a legacy that you can buy you develop a legacy. Someone said it this way. Someone said it that if you ever see a turtle sitting on top of a fence post, ever see a turtle sitting on top of a fence post, you know one thing. The turtle didn't get there by itself. So my dear brother turtles and sister turtlets, I don't care where you are in life. You have to understand that we have not come here we have been brought here, and the reason we've been brought here because somebody believed in us. The greatest gift one human being gives to the other is not a new house, a new car. It's not winning the lottery. The greatest gift one human being gives to another is to believe in them. You cannot give a greater gift than to believe in somebody. So, I'm the president on July the 1st, 1989, of this college in Atlanta now. It's my first day there. I drove my car into my parking space, which said president. Because, you know, I just wanted to take somebody to take a picture of me with my reserved spot there. And I left my car there, and I saw a young man in the front of the university who was uh, mowing the lawns. I went out there, and I waved for him to stop. He was on his John Deere. He stopped, and I shook his hand. I said, hi, my name is Sam. I'm the new president here. And he said, hi, my name is Benson. I'm the janitor here. His full name is Benson M. Karanja. 
I saw something in his eyes. That was 1989. The Lord allowed me to help him in so many different ways. He finished his BA at our college. And from there, he went on to a university and got his MBA. And then we helped him get to, to another university, get his MLS, Massive Library Science in those days. And then uh, he went on to another university, got his doctor of education. He, he worked, I guess, 18 different jobs for me, all the way from uh, assistant librarian to student affairs to uh, dean of this. And, you know, in a, in a college university system, there's so many layers you can move people around. And he and became a vice president. He ended up being my executive vice president. And then in 2003, when I resigned as uh, president of that college, that janitor was now my president. On the first day, he was my janitor. On the last day, he was my president. So whenever I see Benson today, oh, if, I was to, if you were to come on that campus here, the first building you're going to see is a huge auditorium. And the auditorium says, Samuel R. Chand Auditorium, named after me. That's cool. But pretty soon, the bricks will crumble, cement will give way, carpet will need to be changed, something will happen to it. But the greatest legacy I have is not a building named after me. The greatest legacy I have is the president of that university today because he's my living legacy. And so when Jesus found out that he had three and a half years left on this planet, he set out to create his living legacy. Jesus did three things that I think we need to do when we are mentoring somebody. Jesus did three things. Very simple. You will remember this. Discover, develop, deploy. Discover, develop, deploy. Everyone together. Discover, develop, deploy. Say it one more time. Discover, develop, deploy. I, I just, just a couple of illustrations, uh, stories told uh, of, of how he picked different disciples, and, and we know the famous story about the, the, the Peter, James, and John fishing, and so on and so forth. Let me tell you a couple of the stories. One of them is Matthew. Matthew, the tax collector. Matthew is gouging his people. The way Matthew makes his money, he's, he's, a, he's a Jew who is gouging his own people for the occupiers, the Roman government, and the way he makes his money is to charge them over and above what they are supposed to pay. So the Bible tells us that Jesus stepped back and watched Matthew at work. Watched him for quite a while. And when he watched him, he understood what Matthew was doing. He said, you know, Matthew is doing the wrong thing, but doing it great. He's excellent at doing wrong. He's keeping two sets of books, one for the government and one for himself. Jesus walks up to Matthew and says to him those magical words, come, follow me. Matthew left him everything that he was doing, and started following Jesus. But Jesus had a strategic plan for Matthew. Because you see, Jesus knew, Matthew did not know this, but Jesus knew how the New Testament is going to begin. The first book is going to be written by Matthew. And he needed somebody who could keep accurate accounts and an accurate record to open the first 18 verses that we never read. So-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat, and he numbers gener generations. Because Jesus discovered, believed in him when nobody else would believe in him. I want you to know, when he reached out and Matthew was following him around, Jesus took a risk on him. But then there's a second one I want to talk to you about. His name is Thomas. We know Thomas as what? Doubting Thomas. Here we are in the 21st century. Man messed up one time way back then. We're still calling him what? Doubting Tom. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. All over this world and this room, how many of you have ever stolen stuff? I'm going to ask that question again. <laughs> because some of you need to be standing up with both your hands up in the air. How many of you have ever stolen stuff? Okay, a bunch of liars. Why didn't you do that the first time? Doubting Thomas, history informs us, traveled the farthest distance of any disciple of Jesus. And he came to my country, the country of India. 
Now, there were no airplanes. There were no Hummers. There were no GPS. There were no guides. He came all the way from Palestine to my country of India. And history informs us that one day he was watching the Hindu priests in the Indian Ocean who were standing waist deep in the water. And they worshipped the elements and they, they were picking the water and uh, the throwing up to the sun god. And they throw it up to the sun god and the water would keep coming down. <laughs> Thomas pulled up his rabbinical robes, walked right up there into the middle of the group, waist deep in the water, looked at all the Hindu priests and said to them, you throw up water to your God. It goes up and comes back down. If I was to throw water to my God and it hung in the air, would you believe my God? We're talking about who now? Doubting. Thomas. History informs us that he picked up water, threw it up in the air, and it hung in midair. And so there's a whole group of churches, especially in South India today, known as Thomasites. Because even though one day he messed up in a room, but Jesus looked at him and said, I know right now you don't believe in me. But Thomas, uh, my believing in you is not dependent on you believing in me. And he looked at Thomas and said, does not matter what people say about you. I believe in you. I want you to know that does not matter what's going on in your life right now. And you might have stopped believing in yourself. And the people around you might have stopped believing in you. And they might have written you off and taken your file, never put back in the file cabinet that shredded it and thrown it away in the trash can. I am here to tell you that there is a God and he believes in you. Yeah. Not long ago, I saw a picture in a newspaper. A picture of uh, a woman next to a man, and she had her head on his chest. They had never met before. They had just been introduced. But she had her head on his chest. Here's the rest of the story. This woman had a daughter who died in a car accident, but she was an organ donor. This man needed a new heart. So they harvested this daughter's heart and put it in this man's chest. And now this woman had her ear on his chest listening to her daughter's heartbeat. I wonder if somebody was to put their head on your chest how many heartbeats would they hear? There are thousands of hearts beating inside this chest. I still stand tall today, not because I'm tall, but because I tall, stand tall on the shoulders of many. Because somebody believed in me. So Paul takes all of that, and in a very succinct manner, he says this to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. Paul takes three and a half years of Jesus and wraps it up in one verse. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Paul is saying three things to us. One is, I'm a master builder. I want you to know, everyone in this room is a master builder. You're building something. Whatever you are building, but you're building something. Number two, somebody laid the foundation. Paul says, I have laid a foundation. And then Paul goes on to say something, and there will, somebody else is going to come and build on this foundation that I have laid. Isn't it amazing 
that sometimes we start thinking like, I have come here on my own. But we're always building on somebody else's foundation. I want to remind everyone listening to me right now that God believes in you. I believe in you. Jesus believes in you. And this would be a great opportunity for you to do two things. One is for the past and the other is for the future. In the past, I wanted to rewind your life and see all the people who have been big in your life, who brought you to where you are right now. Some of you are listening to me right now in your churches, and some of you are on your couches, and some of you are still laying in bed. Doesn't matter where you're at. Somebody brought you to where you're at. I want to start thinking about those people who have brought you to where you are in life today. And maybe you need to call somebody, email somebody, text somebody, write a note to somebody, send a card to somebody. Somebody needs to send somebody a contact of some nature simply to say thank you. I know this program that goes out of Life Church has got potential of touching literally millions of people. Amazing things can happen all over the planet as people just look back and say thank you to somebody. It could be that parent. It could be that grandparent. It could be your neighbor. It could be your teacher. It could be a coworker, regardless of who it might be. Look back and say thank you. But the second thing is to look to the future and say, Lord, who do I need to discover? Who do I need to develop? And who do I need to deploy? Who do I need to believe in? Not because, see, it's easy to believe in people who've got it all together. It would have been easier to believe in somebody else if it had not been doubting Thomas. It would have been easier to believe in somebody else had it not been for gouging Matthew, the tax collector. It would, it's easy to believe in people who have got a nice package going on. But how do you believe in people? That looks like from the outside, they don't have it. But I'm so glad somebody believed in me. I believe in you. I want to give everyone an assignment right now. And the assignment is that within two hours of you listening to what I'm sharing with you, you will tell at least three people three powerful words. Everyone say it together. I believe in you. Let's do that together. I believe in you. In the next two hours, tell three people, I believe in you. Let me pray with you. Thank you, Lord, for believing in us. When there was no reason to believe in us, you believed in us. When we could not believe in ourselves, you believed in us. And then you sent people into our lives who in a tangible way believed in us. So even as we are reflecting back on our life and we begin to think about how we're going to send a Facebook message or a Twitter or an email or a text or a phone call or a card or a letter, whatever shape, form it might be, as we reflect on our life, we want to stop by and say thank you. But as we look forward to our life, Help us to discover, help us to develop, and help us to deploy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.